This is NatCon Talk, where nationalism and conservatism meet. Today I'll be speaking with Oren Cass. He is the head of a new conservative think tank called American Compass and the author of a truly important book, The Once and Future Worker. Oren Cass, welcome to NatCon Talk. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, Oren, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. I think that for the last few years, probably at least since uh, your, your book, The Once and Future Worker, came out a couple of years ago, I think in Washington and way beyond Washington, uh, you're a name that almost everybody's talking about. I, I, I'd like to say that everybody's saying good things, but as as, as you know, you succeeded in causing the uh, Republican, Republican establishment to kind of circle the wagons. My experience, I think probably like a lot of other people, I, I did not enjoy reading uh, Ayn Rand, but I was uh, th thrilled to discover Milton Friedman. And free to when I read Free to Choose, I, I would say I basically bought you know the whole thing. I basically said, wow, this is incredibly persuasive and makes sense. Um, but I remember that there was one thing that I I told my friends that I that I couldn't make sense of, and that was exactly this argument about it doesn't make any difference how big the trade deficit gets because we're getting refrigerators and cars, and all we're doing is sending them pieces of paper. And even way back then, I think that 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 really bugged me. That you know when 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 you get money you're not getting pieces of paper. That's like kind of a bizarre materialist description of what's happening. You're, you're actually getting power and leverage. And that's, that's something that, uh, that in your book, The Once and Future Worker, you, uh, you expand upon. Can you uh, give us some kind of an idea of how you see uh, proper trade with a country like China? Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the reasons that that the trade question is such a, a great entry into this uh, whole broader discussion is because it it so clearly delineates uh, production from consumption, and and what you realize is that all of those arguments, all of those economic models telling you how great things are working, uh, only consider consumption, and and in fact, economics as we tend to talk about it today. Is, is in a sense the study of consumer welfare and, and maximizing consumer welfare. And look, I, I like consumer welfare too. I'm, I'm not one of these you know, degrowth people who says we, we should all be, be living in cabins in the woods. Uh, I, I think consumption and, and rising living standards are terrific. But what, what you realize as you start to actually kind of push on the models and ask where they're going is that work just literally doesn't matter that if, if, if everybody in a town gets laid off and, and the factory moves overseas and the result is cheaper products coming back, that, that gets a thumbs up. Um, now, that's, that's a little bit over, of an oversimplification because what, what a lot of economists would say is, well, but that's because, of course, we assume that in a well-functioning market, those workers are going to find other different opportunities. And they do a little bit of hand-waving to say that, in fact, there'll be better opportunities, although that's actually nowhere in the model. Um, and, and you just look at that and you say, well, but, but, but that's not how the world actually works. First of all, it's not true that they necessarily move on to, to newer, better opportunities. Uh, and, and secondly, if the kinds of things that are going away are the you know, manufacturing and the, the innovative technology industries, and, and what's left is, is, is service sector jobs running on consumer debt, then that's, that's just not sustainable. Um, and, and so I think there's this way where, where you then realize, well, then it, it can't just be about consumption. Um, you know, pr production matters for the economy as a whole and, and production matters for individuals, you know, people's ability to be contributors to their communities and, and to, to be productive and, and successful in what they're doing is, is at least as important to, to their own well-being, to their families, their kids, their communities as, you know, how big a TV they can get for how cheap. One of the uh, striking things in the book that you, you, you open with is this critique of, uh, uh, of uh, gross domestic product. Now, not, obviously, many of the people who are uh, watching us are not economists, um, but they've all heard that, you know, if, uh, if GDP is going up, then you're supposed to be doing well. And one of the things that you do is to open up kind of an assault on the 
theory, which, you know, which is basically what you hear from the media all the time, if, you know, if this is where, where you're getting your information about the economy is, is it, GDP is going up, right? We're, we're producing more things uh, measured somehow, and that means we're doing well. And you say that's just not true. Can you explain how that could be? How could we be getting better and better in GDP, but just not doing well? While rising GDP is a good thing, wh whose growth matters? And, and that's where the, the production versus consumption frame is still so important, is that, and this goes with, you know, you can say, look, free trade in, improved GDP. It allowed certain people in our society to be far more productive, certain companies to, to produce much more stuff, uh, e even if it left a lot of people behind. And of course, what we then say is, well, we just have to compensate the losers. Uh, the winners have won by more than the losers have lost. And so all we need to do essentially is somehow transfer from one group to the other. And that model, which, which I call in the book economic piety to, to make fun of, of the idea that there's this economic pie and, and we just have to grow the pie and then we, we slice up the pie and everybody gets more pie. Um, that, that at the end of the day is a, is a consumption model. It says as long as you get more pie and everybody likes pie, uh, then there's no problem. And, and the reality to, to take the, the metaphor too far is that we actually care about who's baking the pie, that, that a, a, a government check is not a substitute for a paycheck. It might be in terms of what you can consume, but it is not in terms of uh, your own well-being and, and, again, your ability to, to, to support and, and, and form and sustain a family and contribute to a community. Uh, and, and so if you have a model that says, as long as we're generating more wealth overall, we can always move it around to whoever needs it. Uh, you're, you're again missing so much of what, what, what matters to the human condition. And if, if we instead asked, well, is our economy one that's actually generating good opportunities for, for, for people of all kinds in, in all places to, to build good lives and support their families, then whether or not GDP is going up or not doesn't, doesn't necessarily tell you very much. And, and I think that's exactly what we've seen in recent decades. You, you can get GDP to go up a lot, even as, even as you're failing on, on what I'd say really matters. Well, can we look more closely at, at what you're saying really matters? I mean, this is obviously the crucial point, because from uh, people like, like uh, Friedman or, or Hayek, um, we, th the answer that we always got was, look, the free market produces the best outcomes in terms of wealth, the greatest degree of wealth, the greatest degree of efficiency, the greatest degree of innovation. And if what you're concerned about is, uh, is uh, those people who are not succeeding in fitting into the economy, uh, you know, the, the, those hard luck cases or tragic cases, then all you need to do is to uh, increase by some degree the tr taxation. And as you said before, and you, it, you, you give those people some kind of subsidy and that fits perfectly within, within that free market model. Now you're, you're changing that entire paradigm. You're saying that's just not what we're looking for. We're looking for something else. And that something else you're, you know, you're, you're calling it, uh, uh, looking at the production side. You're saying the the well-being of the family, but take us down into the, what, what's actually happening in the family that you have in mind. This this the, this the, the, this family is receiving the check from the government, and you say that's not good enough. Why? What's wrong with that? Well, I I think it's important to to note as a starting point that, that we're not talking about just hard luck cases here, um, that you know, the, the majority of Americans still don't earn even a community college degree and, and median wages. So, so for you know, the, the middle of the population that you've seen, depending on how you measure it, you know, little to no growth really since the 70s. Um, and, and so what, what we're talking about is, is, is essentially half to the, to the majority of Americans that um, that, that are not seeing the kind of, of, of rising prosperity that just from looking at the aggregate numbers, you, you might think that we're generating. Um, and, and, and the reason that that matters so much, you know, for, for one thing, it, it matters just to the individual. 
Um, and, and, and I'm not a big fan of happiness studies and so forth. And, and frankly, if something that left a lot of people unhappy actually proved to be really terrific for the, the health of our families and communities and nation, I'd, I'd probably be okay with it. Um, but, but it is worth noting that, that really all of the, the social science research tells us that, you know, individuals, uh, their self-esteem, their mental health, um, their self-reported life satisfaction, um, all, all is tied quite closely to, uh, to, to employment or, or having something to do. And, and so if, if that goes away, uh, or, or even if you sort of create a make work job that, that occupies time, but isn't, uh, actually kind of, uh, allowing the person to feel valued and, and needed, um, then, then you have a real, real problem with people at just, just at, at the level of, of their individual well-being. Uh, in my mind, what's what's most important though is the way that that then translates into effects on on families and communities. So, uh, you know, to your question about the the family that's receiving the check, one thing to to recognize right off the bat is that family formation is less likely to happen in the first place. Marriage is less likely to happen um, where men, in particular, don't have uh, well-paying jobs that that are able to to support a family and. And, and frankly, that shouldn't surprise us. That that should align with our intuition that that part of the rationale for marriage is is the formation of the viable economic unit. Uh, and if you say, well, actually, that's not a viable economic unit. Uh, and conversely, if you say whether or not you're married, there's there's a check that's going to cover things. Uh, then then you're you're really both removing the economic incentive for marriage and and devaluing it socially in a sense. Um, you know, likewise, and, and connecting to the individual well-being, um, unemployment for men is, is an extraordinarily strong predictor of divorce. Um, you know, in, in individuals who are unhappy um, don't, don't make for, for healthy families either. And, and so at, at the level of family, uh, you know, if, if we want families at, at the core uh, of our society, they, they have to be viable economic units. Uh, and, and, and I think we especially want that be, because of the implication for, for children. You know, uh, obviously, inherently, children are, are better off in, in stable families, but uh, the evidence also suggests they're better off in, in families where they have adults in the household who are working, uh, or even just in, in communities where there are adults working, that, that there's a real important sort of uh, role model effect and, and, and establishment of, of norms and values and, and preparing the next generation for success. And, and, and I think that, that that kind of intergenerational transmission is, is the most important piece and, and what the, the Milton Friedmans of the world just miss, which is that even if you said, you know, looking at a point in time, the market is going to generate the most efficient outcome, there's no guarantee that, that the efficient point in time set of outcomes is going to be a, a sustainable set or, or one that puts us on the healthiest trajectory over time. And so what you can get instead, and, and what I think we've gotten, is maximizing a lot of short-run consumption, and yet in parallel eroding the capacity of our society, of our families, to actually raise the next generation able to do as well or better themselves uh, at, at, at the personal level. And then likewise, even at the industry level, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of corporations that are maximizing point-in-time profits even as they hollow out our industrial base and our innovative capacity uh, and, and the likelihood that, that we're going to be leaders in the next generation. And, and so again, all of these are things that just the standard efficient market model does not consider, is not built to consider. Uh, and, and when you do that, that sort of desiccated analysis, I, I think you, you head down a path that, that leaves the, the, the nation in a very unhealthy place. All right. I want to focus now on on this question of liberalism and conservatism. Uh, all of the big thinkers of free market, free trade economics, uh, they all called themselves liberals, and uh, historically, that's uh, that that that's uh, that that's a correct designation for for a couple of centuries. And in fact, in uh, in both in British and in American history, uh, there has been a distinct thing that. Uh, that you could call conservative economics that wasn't liberal. If you take, you know, for example, the uh, the founding of the United States, there's you know the the Federalist Party, which is really a nationalist 
party with people like Washington and Hamilton and uh, and, and Jay and Adams. And their their position was, in fact, uh, we need to build ourselves as a nation and we need to use whatever tools economically are, are necessary in order to do that. And the left part of the spectrum was the Jeffersonians and the free, the, the free marketers. And you can sort of say the same kind of thing about you know, about the, the UK, that thinkers like conservative thinkers like, like uh, Burke and Disraeli um, were not the free trade radicals. Is it, when, when you talk about conservative economics, is that, is that the tradition that you are thinking about? Or, or are you still some, somewhere in the liberal zone? It seems to me that that these things all intersect, and uh, and and you know, speaking for myself, again, depending on how you define it, uh, I, I guess I would still see myself as someone fairly liberal in in the classical sense of of, of valuing many things about a liberal society. I, I I think where conservatism has so much to offer, and and where ultimately the the right answer comes in sort of in, in the tension and, and, and push and pull between the two views is that, you know, I, I think conservatism fundamentally is, is, is focused on the idea that, that human nature is, is fairly um, fixed and, and, and to be harsh, a, a bit irredeemable. Uh, and, and that for a society to function, that human nature and, and, and those people have to be shaped and formed and constrained by very strong norms and values and institutions. Um, wh whereas I think the, the, the sort of liberal perspective much more celebrates the, the individual in, in all his freedom uh, and, and sees the potential for perfecting it uh, and, and building a, a sort of uh, new and, and, and greater brave new world out, out, out of the result. Um, and, and so when, when I say we have to sort of find find the good in, in the tension there, you know, I, I, I think we like markets. I, I think the idea that people should be free to um, to to choose their occupation, to to buy and sell as they wish and, and so forth, I, I, I think that's really important, both both as a matter of of rights and liberty and and just as a matter of what is going to generate good outcomes and prosperity. I, I think what we have to recognize is that that doesn't just automatically work on its own, that for that to work, it has to happen in the context of strong uh, institutions and norms and values. And, and also that by its nature, the, the sort of celebration of, of the freedom and, and, and the pressures of the competitive market have a tendency to undermine those institutions and norms and values. And, and so, I think what we've had in, in recent decades in, in the West and especially in America is essentially two liberal parties in, in the classical liberal sense who, who were both advancing a very liberal economic vision um, and, and not paying a whole lot of attention to the, the health of, of the institutions and norms and values. And, and what's needed is for a, a, a reinvigorated conservatism to say, actually, really being in favor of free markets and, and celebrating and, and advancing this the free society actually means accepting a little bit less freedom sometimes. Um, that it, as, as contradictory as, as it sounds, you know, freedom as, or, or liberty as a means and, and freedom or liberty as an ends are, are two different things. And, and if we want to actually, and, and this is right in the American Compass mission statement, you know, if, if what we're striving for is, is to maximize the, the liberty and prosperity of the nation, the way to do that isn't just to make sure everybody has as much freedom and cheap stuff as possible at every moment in time. That's, that's actually a terrible way to, to preserve a, a, a prosperous and free nation. And so what, what conservatives, I think, can really offer is pointing out the many ways that, that a successful economic system actually depends on, on a lot of things besides just free people in the market. Well, look, I, I uh, unlike most of the, unlike most of the critics of, uh, uh, of conservatism who are promoting uh, free market uh, orthodoxy, unlike them, I've spent most of my life living in an actual socialist country, and um, and I've experienced it for real. I know what it's like to have more than half of my paycheck. Um, 
uh, disappear every month, you know, plus uh, very high value added tax, import taxes, uh, government control of all sorts of sectors, including the education, the higher education sector, which which which, which is the sector I'm most directly involved in. I, I know what it's like, and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. And I I know that many people who are listening to you, that what the, what they're thinking is, you know, my gosh, this this guy is basically proposing that uh, that we bring socialism. To the United States now, I, 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 I take your your criticism about the use of labels. The ideas are more important than the labels, but at the same time, you know, the the labels do express something. When people say socialism, they have in mind something something a lot like the Israeli economy, where you know there are certain certain sectors that you know that are 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 are, are maybe wildly successful and and very free market like, but. Overall, it's all being uh, decided by a bureaucracy. And when you get to meet that bureaucracy, which you do all the time, what you feel is, you know, I'm, I'm paying my taxes to pay the salaries of these people so that they can come up with arbitrary, senseless regulations to tell me what to do. And I don't want to live like that. Right? I, I, I think that that is actually um, a very healthy impulse to want government to uh, to not be this kind of uh, uh, this octopus that's sort of involved with you everywhere, and and so I think it's fair to ask you. You know, it, uh, it, I I'm very very drawn to the idea that government should be thinking about uh, the family and the community and uh, religious tr traditions and especially about whether people have work or not. But I'm afraid to go in the direction of the kind of socialist economy that I live in. What, what do you have to say about that? Well, I think the distinction that, that I like to make, and, and some people will find it a little you know, too cute, but, but I think it's a, a very important and concrete one, it is a distinction between rules and, and conditions. And, and what I mean by that is that I think when, when you look out on, on the market, you, you, you have the sort of hardcore classical liberals who will say that the market pretty much gets it done and uh, we, we can really just leave it alone. Um, and, and we're accustomed to thinking of that as the right of center. And, and then we're accustomed to the left of center as, as bringing this viewpoint that actually the market generates all sorts of bad outcomes. And so we need lots and lots of interventions in the market. We need lots of rules about exactly what you can and can't do. We need a lot of taxes to collect money from, from this group and, and programs to send it to that group. Uh, and, and that's how we're going to sort of correct for everything that we don't like about the market. Um, I, I think the conservative attitude isn't that. In fact, there, there are very few places where you, where you will find me suggesting that what, what we need is a, a bunch of new rules and, and, and taxes and, and programs. Um, but but what, what we do need, I think, and, and this goes back to, to how I've been defining conservatism, is much more attention to the, the conditions in which the market operates. Um, and, and so one set of conditions I would actually say is, you know, over-regulation. That, that in fact, in a lot of ways, um, having less regulation on the market is likely to generate better outcomes. I, I think that's something that the right of center tends to be exactly right about. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of other things that I think matter a lot. So for instance, uh, education as an institution, I think is something we have an, an enormous public interest in and, and that ultimately uh, we need to be investing in not just push as many people as we can through college, but actually as, as a system that helps to prepare young people for adulthood and, and productive work. Uh, and, and our system doesn't do that today at all, and, and we see the effects in the economy. So our, our educational institutions, I think, need to behave very differently if, if we then want to see different downstream uh, effects in the economy. I, I think the same thing goes for uh, organized labor. You know, I, I think certainly labor unions as they exist today are, are quite dysfunctional in America. But, but the idea of labor, the idea that workers should be able to organize collectively um, have power in the labor market, represent their interests, uh, have a voice in workplace governance. I think those are, are really, really important things. And, and that, that 
anyone who is sort of enthusiastic about the promise of a of a market economy uh, should want to see those things working as you know as as Adam Smith did. Adam Smith wrote about exactly that. John Stuart Mill wrote about the importance of of labor and, and union representation. So to to say that we want those things isn't to be socialist. It's to say we want to actually build the structures in our society that are, are going to make the market economy work well. Uh, and, and then a final area where, where I, I, I do a lot of work is, is on uh, under the general heading of what's called industrial policy, um, which, which at the end of the day comes down to the question of how we invest. Um, you know, markets, again, do some things well, and there are other things they don't do well or don't do at all. And ensuring that investment in, in a society and an economy flows toward uh, the, the places that are going to, to do the most long run good for the nation as a whole, it's not something that markets are going to do. No, no one in the market has an incentive to do that. Um, now, obviously, government isn't going to be perfect at it either. And, and saying, well, let's just let government pick all the investments makes no sense. Um, but, but that, again, I think is an argument for, for thinking about what structures would be more effective. How do we uh, make it more rewarding to, to make long-run investments? How do we actually support and subsidize? Uh, for instance, there's, there's something that I think is very effective called pre-competitive research, where you let the different companies in an industry come together uh, and put in money to do research and development that, that will then be public, that everyone in the industry can share. And when they do that, you say, and government's going to match what you spend. So it's not government choosing uh, what to invest in necessarily. You, you still need to have the private sector willing to show up and put its, its money where its mouth is, but it, it's government uh, setting both the rules for how we're going to treat the intellectual property and, and providing some public resources to encourage a kind of investment that we think would be especially productive. And, and so, so things like that, I think, are, are, again, how we have to think about the, the market economy, not as something that's basically just going to get it done if we get out of the way, not as something that we just tell what to do, but something that needs a lot of other supports from the public sector, from other institutions, uh, and and public policy has to have a role to play in uh, in making sure that that works. So l- let's let's take as an example um, uh, the 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 issues that that you began with um, labor, the the fact that people should have uh, work instead of being on the dole if it's possible, and family formation, uh, the 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 idea that uh, that where uh, productive, respected labor of some kind is available, then it'll be possible to go back to uh, something approx- uh, uh, approximating a, 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 a more traditional family, by, by which I mean uh, a non-broken family in, a, a, as kind of a norm. Can you, can you tell us, as an example, how, how could you proceed to design a policy that would uh, n- nudge or move society in the direction that you're describing, in that conservative direction, while at the same time deregulating and making sure that you don't have you know, government uh, uh, planning and detailing half of the economy. Tell us, how could you do that? Well, sure. Let's take an example from from the education world, where today we have a a system of public education that essentially makes its goal to get people through college. And our our high schools, to a significant extent, are are now what I would say are are basically college prep academies. We spend about one hundred fifty billion dollars a year subsidizing higher education. Uh, but if you get to the end of high school and, and you're not going on to college, we we basically have nothing for you. Uh, We say, sorry about that, you're on your own. And even though that is exactly the group who, uh, who who is having the hardest time and, and, and seeing the worst outcomes in our economy. Now, what would we do about that? Well, one piece of it is just, we should shift the funding, we should say, the way that we should be making public investments in education isn't to support uh, people who are going to college necessarily, it's to support institutions that help uh, people get a good start in life. Sometimes for some people that institution might be the university, but but an awful lot of the time it's actually going to be an employer. 
uh, or it's going to be an employer in partnership with a community college. And so if we said our goal was, was not to create this incredible pathway called college and get as many people onto it as we can, even though most won't finish, uh, but instead it's to have different pathways that, that provide a good start and a helping hand in connecting people to the labor force, uh, then, then we would take an awful lot of those resources and we would say, uh, if you are a trainee at, at an employer, that's just as valid as being a student on a campus. And, and we are going to uh, essentially provide funding for that just the way as we would provide funding to a campus. And so it is still up to employers, uh, whether they want to take on trainees, what they think is the most effective way to train them. Uh, a lot of times what they're going to do is to decide actually a community college program would be the best for them. Uh, but, but if that's what they decide, then instead of the community college trying to cater to some 18 year old kid who doesn't know what he wants, the community college has to cater to the employer. Uh, and, and so a program like that, again, it's, are we spending money? Yes. Although it's, it's funny, we already spend much less well, I would say. Um, but, but ultimately what it is, is it's, it's a structure. It, it is a, a model for the economy that says we are going to make this particular activity employing younger unskilled people or people later in life who are shifting careers, uh, helping them train and, and move into a job. Uh, and that's something that we're going to support. And it's going to be up to the economy what industries that happens in, where, you know, how many employees to hire and so on and so forth. Uh, but but the, the kind of infrastructure we want to have for people moving through that part of their life uh, is going to be one that, that really emphasizes on the job learning and, and employer guided training. You know, I should I should mention that uh, uh, when your 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 book came about a year ago, uh, my my wife Yael uh, got to the book before before I did. She read it before I did, and she's from a um, a, a a working class town, uh, a kind of r rural outside of uh, uh, Erie in Western Pennsylvania, and um, uh, she, we met at college, but. Uh, she was one of the few people from her high school went in that direction. And um, she she told me to tell you that she thought your book was spectacular. Uh, and uh, she she was uh, definitely uh, nodding, nodding in agreement her whole way through it. Now, Yael and I have raised uh, at, at this point, we 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 are uh, on our seventh teenager. So we've uh, we, we've we've seen a lot in in terms of education, and the older we get and the more experienced we get at uh, bringing up young people, the more striking it is to us that uh, high schools and we've tried an awful lot of different high schools that high schools just don't work for a lot of kids, and uh, where, where where we live in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, the kids start having trouble. They send them immediately to the psychologist. The psychologist immediately puts them on on Ritalin or some kind of you know performance enhancing, who knows what, which the kids don't necessarily do well on either. And so we have some kids who, you know, were happy as clams in high school and went on to university, and 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 uh, they're just fine with the system. And we have other kids, uh, and especially boys, who. Um, who who aren't built for it? Now I'm not saying that they're not built for you know some some kind of um, um, highly respected profession later in life, but I can tell you that when when they're in high school and you know in 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 the like massive hormone years, asking them to sit still and listen to you know it with thirty or thirty five other kids listen all day long to you know some teacher talk. It's a disaster. I mean, this is something that basically was, you know, in, invented, I don't know, uh, 100 or 115 years ago. And we're doing this big experiment of putting all our kids in that, you know, as you say, college prep environment. Um, from my anecdotal experience, it it just isn't working. So I'm I'm really happy to hear that, you know, that there might be a possibility of a, a revision of what what the goals of you know, high school are even before you get to the question of, you know, uh, are, are universities do, doing their jobs? Um, so that makes a lot of intuitive sense to me. Um, in in the book, you you also in the book, you also raise um, the possibility of 
uh, directly subsidizing labor instead of subsidizing unemployment because you know basically what we're doing right now is if you're unemployed then you know then you get a big check and then if you uh, go to work then generally you're going to work in in a low paying uh, low paying job and the incentive to go back to work into work is is kind of uh, ruined in a lot of cases because of that do, do you still stand by that that theory that possibility that a similar kind of shift in resources could or should move from uh, from unemployment or uh, underemployment to employment, to people who are doing actual work. Yeah, I think a wage subsidy is, is still a really important idea. Um, the, the, the caveat that I always emphasize is that it, it is it is a limited remedy. That is the the, the share of the of, of the labor force or, or the economy that you can address with with a wage subsidy, uh, I, I think is just inherently not going to be that high. So, uh, for instance, the the version that I propose in the book picks what's what's called a target wage of of about fifteen dollars an hour, and and what that means is whatever your market wage is. Uh, we're going to have have a subsidy that makes up half the difference. So, so if if you're earning nine dollars an hour, the difference to fifteen is six. So you get three dollars an hour of subsidy. And what that what that does is that means as your market wages go up towards fifteen, uh, your your subsidy goes down to zero. And and then if you're above fifteen dollars an hour, of, of course you're not receiving a subsidy. So for, for the very low end of the labor market, when you're talking about those, those unskilled or, or entry level jobs, um, you know, maybe very young people, people who are, are on the threshold of, of choosing whether to join the labor market at all, uh, I, I think the wage subsidy can make, make an enormous difference, both in, in encouraging people to, to, to get into the job market and take that job. Uh, and, and then of course, it's also a way to get more resources to, to them and their families. So. It's a form of redistribution, but but one that's at least tied to their productive work in, instead of most programs, which are essentially tied to the absence of work. Um, and, and so essentially as, as an anti-poverty program and, and a, a better way of running a safety net and, and a way to, to help those really in the most disadvantaged situations, I, I think it's, it's a really important part of, of, of an economic program. Uh, it's it's not going to solve the the broader problem, which is that the you know even people in the middle of the distribution um, are, are are not seeing wage growth uh, certainly compared to what people at the top are seeing and and are falling behind relative to uh, to to the cost of of raising a family uh, and and so um, yes yes as an anti poverty program and and a way to encourage work. Um, but but it can only be one piece of of a of, of a broader solution. Okay, so now when you're looking at that at that broader solution, um, and trying to address uh, the 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 issue of uh, working class uh, wages having remained, you know, roughly fixed uh, for 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 a couple of decades, maybe longer, um, and also. You know that taking place at a time when uh, many people are are in fact getting getting wealthier. I mean, it's not not hasn't hasn't been a a, a time where nobody's getting wealthier. When you're thinking about that, what it, what are the principal tools that you think are appropriate? And you know, again, uh, a, a conservative audience is going to be asking, um, is it possible to do anything about this issue that you're talking about? Uh, without uh, vastly increasing regulation, as though we don't have enough, and without government actually, you know, taking charge of pieces of the economy and picking winners and losers, you know, all those questions. So, how would you approach that? Well, so I, I think one step of it, in in a lot of cases, is to reduce regulation. Um, but but the framework that that I think we have to have in mind as as we approach the, the problem generally is that that this is all about investment. Um, that, that, that when you think about sort of the, the premise of capitalism, and, and it's right there in the title, capital, um, the, the secret sauce is the, the deployment of capital, the, the investment by those who have capital in productive enterprises um, that are, are going to create more and better opportunities for 
workers who are, are going to be the vast majority of, of the people in the society. And, and what's important to recognize is that there is nothing automatic about that. Um, that is, you, you can also have capital making a lot of investment and generating a lot of profit with it, which is what it is focused on in ways that, that don't create um, the kinds of opportunities that we want. Um, and, and that are the, the, the premise of the system. So, so just as an aside, I, I think it's really important to, to remember when, when we talk about, you know, should there be constraints on, on capital and so forth, that the, the, the market economy and, and competition within it is, is not something that we set up as an end unto itself because we're, we're really happy when corporations generate big profits. The, 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 the point of the exercise is, is to be building an economy that's generating widespread prosperity. Uh, and, and supporting families and communities and so forth. So if, if the way the system is working is to generate a lot of profit without doing those things, then, then the system's not actually working. And, and so a, a well-functioning capitalist market economy is one in which those incentives are aligned so that the way that you earn a lot of profit and therefore the things that capitalists want to go do um, happen to also be things that generate uh, a lot of really terrific opportunity and prosperity for everybody else. Um, and there have been times in, in our history when that has been working very well uh, and, and times when it hasn't. And whether it is or not is a function of the, the set of rules and institutions that, that you have operating around your market. Uh, so how do we get investment flowing in, in a productive direction? Well, uh, one element, as we just talked about, is education. I mean, if, if, if you were to say to the world, uh, we're going to have a, a sort of well-trained uh, set of workers at all different skill levels, and in fact, financial support for, for bringing them on and, and training them up, um, that's a very different message out to people who want to build businesses than the message we have today, which is, we spend lots and lots of money preparing college graduates for you and do absolutely nothing for anybody else. So the kind of human capital investments we make publicly has, has a major effect then on, uh, on, on what might be an attractive investment if, if you're an entrepreneur or, or, or running a big business. Um, I, I think likewise, and, and this gets to sort of the, the, the nationalist question and, and, and the globalization question, uh, for this to be working, it has to be the case that the way to build a business and generate profit is to use American workers who are here. Um, that, that used to just be an inherent constraint based on, on both the sort of rules of, of immigration and trade uh, and, and also just technological limitations. And one thing we've seen in recent decades is, is that's gone away. If, if a better way to generate profit is to use workers somewhere else or to bring in workers from somewhere else, then unsurprisingly, that's what the businesses are going to try to do. And so actually imposing constraints that say, no, no, you actually have to use the workers who are here, I think is one of the most powerful ways to, to get those incentives aligned. How now, do when you, do you say that? that how, how do you do that? Let, 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 let's be concrete. I know we're just talking about examples, but what could you do in order to do that? Well, so I think you can constrain the flow of immigration into the country. You can you can certainly get rid of the sort of temporary worker programs um, that that are not even genuine immigration. They are merely a function of of attempting to meet employers' labor needs. Uh, and and then with respect to to real immigration, uh, I think you look at its effect on the labor market and you say, what are there segments of the labor market where uh, we we currently are not seeing sufficient uh, opportunities for the people who are already here. And if that's the case, then we shouldn't be adding more such people. Um, that, that at the end of the day is not uh, the, the right answer for the American people. Um, so, so both a, a skills-based immigration system and a real limit to, if not elimination of uh, programs that just bring people in temporarily, I think uh, is, is, is very important. And then likewise on the trade side, I think you have to take actions to, to say that we're not going to run these $500 billion a year trade deficits. That the way that free trade is supposed to work is it's supposed to actually be trade, which means we're happy to have other countries making more stuff that comes here if in return we are making more stuff that goes there. 
And, and the one-way relationship where we go make our stuff somewhere else and no one comes and makes their stuff here isn't going to fly. Um, it, it's actually a funny thought exercise to, to throw out sometimes. You say, well, like, what's, what's a good example of a, you know, country from, you know, or a company from, from pick your country that, uh, that opened up a factory in the U.S. recently to, to ship product back to, back to their home country. And people will kind of laugh, like, that's ridiculous. Why would anyone come to America to, to make something and send back to their own country? Um, but, but they shouldn't laugh because if free trade were working, that's what they would do. Um, and so taking on that trade imbalance, I, I think you can, you can do a few different things. One is you can uh, much more aggressively confront countries that are creating intentional distortions. And China is the, the obvious example here. Uh, and you can say, look, we're, we're just, first of all, we're not going to tolerate um, the kinds of intellectual property theft um, and, and, and subsidies that, and, and limits of access to their market that they undertake. Uh, and and if, if they're going to do that, then, then we're going to retaliate. We're not going to have that kind of trading relationship. Uh, and for that matter, we have other leverage. We're going to deny them access to our financial markets. We're going to uh, deny them access to our universities and, and so on and so forth. So so that's one piece of it. And, and then from the domestic side, we can do a lot more to make America a relatively more attractive to produce things. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the ways we could support and encourage domestic innovation. Um, I, I think our tax code could be a lot more supportive of, of uh, domestic investment. Um, and, and then, you know, I think there are even cases where you, you look at a, a supply chain and you say, that's actually something that, that needs to be here. Uh, and so we're just going to use local content requirements. We're going to say you have to make that here. Uh, and, and, and with all of these things on, on both the, the, the immigration side and the trade side, of, of course, you, you say them and, and the business lobby, you know, I, I won't say literally sets its hair on fire, but <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them if they got stressed out enough to literally set their hair on fire. But, but they certainly figuratively set their hair on fire and run around screaming that you're, you know, first of all, that this is socialism or you're destroying capitalism or whatever. And of course, it's, it's going to, 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 to ruin these businesses and shrink our economy and blah, 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 blah. And, and I don't say blah, blah, blah lightly. I say blah, 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 because it's, it's nonsensical. I mean, in any other context, you talk about the, the problems that we have in a society and, and it is the exact same people who are first to jump up and tell us about the extraordinary innovative power of, of competition and the market to solve whatever problem we have and, and on and on, unless you tell them that the problem we have is, uh, or, or the constraint that they face is uh, actually using workers here. And then all of a sudden it's impossible. Uh, but, but the reality is that it's not. If, if those were the constraints within which you had to make profit, then companies would find ways to make profit in those ways. And, and that's exactly what we want. And, and so, um, you know, j just zooming way out for a moment, this, this in a sense gets back to that, that liberal versus conservative dichotomy where um, if your model is um, constraint bad, freedom good, uh, and, and the more of it we have, the happier everybody is, then, then of course the things I'm, I'm saying are, are very stressful. If, if, if the model you have is a more conservative one that says, no, no, for, for that freedom to be used responsibly and for the market to generate good outcomes, it's going to need to operate in the context of constraints and institutions that, that, that channel behavior toward the common good, then, then I would think you would be nodding along and saying, yeah, these, these are probably the kinds of things we need. And, and so that's exactly why what, what I would call con conservative economics turns out to be uh, so at odds with, with what we have called conservative, but, but is actually the most liberal economics possible. Well, I, I think that the word conservative usually is used to describe a, uh, a tradition that is uh, cer certainly in, uh, in Britain and America, uh, con where conservatism, uh, the conservative tradition that, that we know arose, that's usually used to describe a tradition that is more realistic. Sometimes you can call it realist. It's more empirical. Um, and uh, what you were saying earlier about uh, about socialists is that uh, the common denominator for for most socialist theories, but also for some liberal theories, 
is their utopianism that they they rely on gross oversimplification and they they leave out lots of things so part of a conservative economics should be it seems if if uh, uh, if we follow your train of thinking, is that it's more realistic, that it says human beings actually, um, uh, when they're feeling good, when they're doing well, uh, they tend to form families, they tend to form communities, there's productive labor taking place in those communities, and they also tend to form nations, and, and, and those uh, nations are characterized by people wanting to uh, look out look out for one another, you know, to, to defend, defend one another. That doesn't, you know, mean that you have to, uh, to take advantage of that in order to try to impose socialism. But conservatives, see, almost all of the conservative thinkers that I've ever read think that the nation is actually a real uh, loyalty group and that, uh, that it needs to be uh, encouraged, cultivated, that it, that, that it has needs. But when, you know, when you say that today, um, definitely on on the right uh, in American Britain, the reaction that you get is uh, is you're 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 reifying the nation. You're creating something that doesn't exist. There isn't anything other than uh, than individuals and and the choices that they make. Uh, are 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 you working within a framework where you see nations as uh, as real things, and is that part of what makes you a conservative? Well, I think I think you have to work within the the framework of, of the nation, um, particularly just as a as a political reality. Um, I, I think that if if we are going to have a functioning democratic republic in which we select representatives who then are supposed to act on on behalf of their constituents, um, then then, then all public policy analysis has to operate within the frame of asking who those constituents are and, and what their interests are. And, and so for an American policymaker, by definition, the question has to be, uh, what are the policies of, that, that are of interest to, to the American people? And if it is of, of interest to the American people to, uh, to philanthropically or otherwise uh, want to make investments on, on behalf of, of people in other countries, uh, that's, that's certainly our prerogative to, to do that. And, and I think we should choose to do some of that. But the, the moment that you, that you we're, we're back to constraints again, the, the moment you remove the constraint that uh, the frame of reference for policy analysis is the, the constituents of the Republic, I, I think it all everything goes out the window. I mean, it, it's fine to stand up and say, "Well, I'm I'm here to operate on on behalf of humanity," but that is a totally non non justiciable standard. Some, someone else could stand up and, and say they're here to operate on on behalf of something else, um, and and so as that's partly a philosophical point that I think it's crucial to do the analysis in 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 the context of America. Uh, it's it's also a, a a very practical point, which is that if you don't, you're going to lose and get replaced by something else. And and this idea that uh, a a sort of well-meaning set of political actors can can sort of beneficently balance these factors and and take someone else's concerns in, into primary consideration. Uh, is only going to last until the next election when someone else who who, who doesn't do that stands up and, and, and someone stands up and says, no, I'll actually uh, act act on, on behalf of American interests. And so, you know, to, to the extent that uh, all, all of the well-meaning people don't serve their constituents' interests, they're, they're going to get somebody who they like an awful lot less uh, ultimately in power. Um, and, and so I think through, through that political lens, it, it, it has to be about the question of, of, uh, of what benefits Americans. Uh, and, and, and then the last piece of it, in my mind, get, getting away from, from politics to sort of sheer principle, even in, you know, if you had a benevolent dictator running things, uh, is, is that the, I, I think the concept of, of solidarity is actually really important. Um, I, I think that for, for a society to operate well, um, there, there has to be some sense of mutual obligation to, to some other set of people. And, and if, if you say, well, the obligation is just to everybody, that, that's another way of saying the obligation is to nobody. 
um, to to actually have have the system work and and to have people you know ultimately assume different roles in life and 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 positions in the society um, there there has to be some bargain and and some sense of of mutuality and and you know a lot of that is going to be at the local community level but given the way our economy operates i think a lot of that can and should be at the national level as well uh, and and so it, you know it, it, it's not surprising that those who who would would most like to escape such bonds are those who try to kind of pr promote a, a global orientation instead um, but but it is precisely because it we cannot allow them to escape those bonds that that we need those bonds for the society to be healthy that that I think it's so important to insist on uh, on on talking in these terms and and asking well well what is in the interest of the nation looking forward um America has been through uh, quite quite a bit these last few years, and uh, um, and Europe, I, I I wouldn't say is is, is far behind. It's it, it's tur turbulent times to say the least. Um, what 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 do you have to say to uh, uh, to people who are thinking about uh, the the future of their uh, of their country right now and uh, uh, and are concerned. I think it comes back exactly ultimately to this question of, of solidarity. I think at the end of the day, and, and speaking specifically in the American context, um, the, the question is, are, are those who are sort of best off and, and, and most successful and, and happy with, with the status quo um, prepared to make some sacrifices in recognition that the status quo is not sustainable? And, and let's just keep doing this forever isn't a choice. We either uh, find a way to, to, to recalibrate to some extent and, and make sure that uh, our, our society and, and culture and, and our market uh, is, is one that, that works better for, for, for folks who have been left behind um, or else the whole thing is gonna fall apart. Um, I, maybe I am naively optimistic that, that there's a chance that that, that that realization happens. Uh, I, I think historically in, in America, there's a good tradition of, of it happening. Um, but of course that I would say is, is the nature of any nation. You, looking back, you always have a historical tradition of it happening because as soon as it doesn't happen, uh, well then you don't have a, <laughs> a nation to look back on anymore. Um, but, but I do think, you know, there are policy levers that we can pull um, there, there are changes that people can make. There are cultural shifts that can happen uh, that that would really reorient our attention to to these factors that that matter most uh, to, to the question of of family and community and, and industry and 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 place. Um, and 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 if if there were to be a a substantial majority in the country that that wanted to make that kind of progress, uh, then then we can do it, uh, and so that's you know that's 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 what I'm trying to work on anyway. Is is both making the argument that that something is wrong and we need to address it, and then trying to help to to lay the foundation for for the kind of steps we could take. Oren Cass, thank you for joining us on NatCon Talk. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time.